At 102 years old, Alice K. Lattice passed away last week. Now, you probably know her better for her book, 1982's The G-Spot. Abdul, I'll say it here. Before I go on, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the little bell so you never miss our content. Alice K. Lattice, you probably never heard of her, but you've probably heard of the title of her book that you wrote in 1982, The G-Spot. And it was about, well, the G-Spot. Per Lattice, that is a space on the anterior side of the vagina, right under the pubic bone that is intensely innervated and a source of sexual pleasure in people with vaginas. Now, why do I say all this? Because that book was a firestorm in 1982. It set off a moment of sexual awakening for women all over the country who were newly coming to think about their own sexual experience. Now, if you watch this channel, you know we're pretty G-rated, but this one's really, really important. Because we often think about sex as disembodied from the rest of a human being. In fact, I think that's part of the problem with the way that our society takes on sex. We don't think about it as part of a whole human experience, but rather too often the things that sexualize people also objectify them. And this book was unique because it actually forced society to reckon with the fact that sex is not a one-way act. It takes two people to have sex, and too often, when one of those people has a vagina, their experience is fundamentally discounted. Now, on a channel that focuses on the relationship between health and society, what's sex got to do with it? Well, a lot. We know that a fulfilling sexual life is associated with better physical health, better mental health. People who have good, rewarding sex in a safe and uplifting way tend to rate their quality of lives as being substantially better because, well, sex is good. And you gotta imagine what it means when a full half of the population's sexual experiences are basically forgotten. Instead, when it came to sex, we always thought about it as being about men. But Alice changed all of that with her co-authored book, The G-Spot. Now, at the time it was published, back in 1982, when I was negative two years old, this book was something that the scientific establishment very much frowned upon. Because as we've talked about so many times on this channel, too often scientists are unaware of their own bias. They argued that Lattice's book had no evidence behind it. Since the scientific evidence is pretty clear that there is probably something called a G-spot. Now, it differs in where it is, how large it is, and the intensity of the sexual experience that it can promulgate. But most of the scientific evidence suggests that there's something there. And, well, I'll leave it to those who actually have a G-spot to confirm. That being said, the response to Lattice's book is really important for us to break down. Not only was the scientific establishment taking issue with the question of a G-spot, they were taking issue with a book that questioned so much of the bias that kept the establishment from asking very simple questions about women's sexual experience to begin with. Now look, there had been folks who'd study this before. You have Masters and Johnson. Their research was conducted back in the 60s. But there haven't been many people who've actually studied sex. But it's not just about studying it. It's about communicating it to everyday folks, making sure that whatever science you're doing is being translated to folks all around the country who can actually use it. This would be a great time to bring you a message from our sponsors, the Marguerite Casey Foundation. The recent upsurge in book bans is a stark reminder that the ideas and stories found in books have the power to help us reimagine a better world and change everything. Why else would right-wing forces be trying so hard to ban them? Our sponsor, Marguerite Casey Foundation, has a book club to help fuel our freedom dreams. The MCF book club, Reading for a Liberated Future, features the ideas of leaders who encourage us to imagine how we can radically transform our democracy, economy, and society. Together, their series of more than a dozen book club events offers a course toward a liberated future. Sign up for the MCF book club and check out their recent event in honor of the newly released book, Let This Radicalize You, Organizing and the Revolution of Reciprocal Care at caseygrants.org slash book dash club. Now, as the Marguerite Casey Foundation book club reminds us, books are really powerful. And the reason books are powerful is because they empower the reader of the book. And what Alice K. Lattice did was publish a book about women's sexual experiences. The whole point here is to empower women. And say what you will about the moralizing of a sexualized society. I think we're all better off if people understand their own bodies. They understand how to use them. And so pushing back against a book that empowers people to understand their own physiology and what they should expect out of a sexual experience says a lot about your priors going into that conversation. And too often our priors suggest that there's a double standard about conversations about sex and about who gets to enjoy sex depending upon physiology. But what Alice Dadas did was write a book to change that balance of power. We could use a lot more changing of that balance of power because it's not just women's sexual health that tends to be ignored. I want you to think about all of the different ways that our physiology changes the kind of healthcare that we can expect. You think about access to period products. The first time that somebody's reproductive organs start to do the thing that they do and start to bleed as a function of it, we're not right there empowering them with an understanding 
of what's happening and the products that they need to be able to maintain their dignity through the experience. We talked about the experience of sex itself, but think about the experience of pregnancy. Too often, people in our society are discriminated against systematically because of their capacity to get pregnant. Whether it's government telling them what they can do in that circumstance, whether or not they actually have ownership of their own bodily autonomy and can decide the outcome of that pregnancy, or even if they choose to carry full term, the kind of health care that they need and deserve, and what it means for their access to the job market. Think about it. We don't have paid family leave in this country. We don't invest in children, which, by the way, are the outcome of a pregnancy. And guess who that falls hardest on? The people who had to carry the pregnancy in the first place. All of that suggests that we do not invest in people with vaginas, fundamentally, let alone when we think about the upside of having one, the sexual experience. And then you think about the experience of menopause. When all of that physiological machinery shuts down, we have failed fundamentally to invest in a full suite of healthcare products that empower people to address their symptoms in a dignified way. Rather, too often doctors tell them that you just got to suffer through it, that many, many, many women before you have had that experience. Why are you complaining now, despite debilitating hot flashes and other kinds of experiences? All of this suggests a systematic failure to think about the needs of a whole half of our population. So, Alice Lattice, we appreciate you and our hats off.